So, um, okay, so let's get started. And uh, what we're going to do today, my plan is to do a little bit of the, um, so if you get the chance, I don't know if you get the chance to look at the derivation notes that I posted, which uh, is more, has more stuff than what we did um, on Thursday. So remember on Thursday, we we're trying to derive the full conditional for multiple parameters in uh, in the hierarchical model that we have. So, yeah. So we're not going to do the derivation, of course, um, but just I want to go over part of it, especially last time we looked at, um, I think, the full, full conditional posterior distribution for mu j and sigma, right? I think those are the two that we looked at. And then there are two other parameters, which is the mu, that is the mean, in the prior for the mu j's, and also tau, that's the standard deviation in the prior for mu j. Okay, so we didn't derive those two, but I said that, because those, they don't appear in the likelihood. They only have, um, like they have their own priors, but they also contribute to the priors of mu j. So those are the only places that they appear. So in terms of deriving the full conditional posterior distribution for them, it's actually less complicated because you just have fewer terms that you work with. Um, but even so, last time I think um, I was trying to get the message that, well, if you're um, just looking at the full conditional posterior distribution for certain parameters, for example, mu j, so this is a good time to, to look at it. Uh, all right. Uh, so, so the document will like, walk you through, um, do it step by step, but for us, we, let's focus on just looking at the results. Uh, okay, so the result for mu j, if you roughly remember what we did over here, uh, is this uh, equation 14. So this is the full conditional posterior distribution for mu j, okay? So last time I was saying, okay, um, in fact, when you're trying to derive the full conditional posterior from mu j, all of the other y i j's in other groups, as well as like the other mu non j, they wouldn't matter in terms of the derivation. Okay? So that's what you see, not only like in equation 13, when we are doing those step by step, but also in equation 14, that if you look at the mean, and uh, in this case, the standard deviation, of the posterior, or I should say full conditional posterior distribution from uj, you realize that only yj's that are in group j matter. Okay, so that's what you see here, that this part, you're only going to have, um, say, well, you can write like yi bar, or yj bar, I should say. Um, but then if you look carefully about what you're summing over, you're only summing over the observations in the group J, okay? Nothing else. Okay? So that, as you can see, so in addition to that, you can see that in terms of the sample size, you only care about the sample size in the group. Okay? So that's what you see in NJ here. And similarly, those goes into um, the standard deviation. Okay? So that, again, uh, reinforces the understanding, um, our understanding of the model, that you are sharing information across groups, but in terms of updating each particular mean for the group, you're only looking at observations in those groups. Okay, so that's pretty important uh, to keep in mind. So that's what we saw for mu j. And quickly, if we go down here to look at the case for sigma, so, uh, yeah, so equation 15, multiple lines is doing the derivation, and uh, equation 16 is the final full conditional posterior distribution, so we know that it's a gamma. And uh, what we know, again, is sigma, remember sigma is in the likelihood of mu, j, and sigma. So that parameter sigma is being shared not hierarchically, but it's being shared across all of the groups. It's the same standard deviation parameter for the yij within each group. So not surprisingly, in order to update the, um, in the Gibbs sample, in order to update sigma, you have to look at all of the 
data in some sense, if you look at the form here. Right? So the first parameter, pretty much this is actually equals to n, the total number of observations, okay? divided by 2. Okay? Mm -hmm. And the second term over here is you notice the 2 summation here. You're pretty much doing, um, so first of all, I get all of the deviation of my observation to the mean, take the square within the group, right? And then after that, I sum them up again. Okay, so this is, if you think it through, you know that you're actually going through each observation. First of all, in each group you go through, each observation, and then you go, go through all of the groups. So essentially, you are going through all of the observations. Okay, so that, again, is because sigma is being shared in this particular way that is being recognized or used as the one single parameter, shared parameter as the standard deviation. So that means all of the data contribution matters to, to the update of that. Okay. So this again tells us more, I would say, about how the model is being set up. So I think this was what I was trying to say last time at the end. That even though mu j and sigma, they're shared across the groups, but they're shared in a different way. That sigma is being shared as the only parameter being used whereas mu j actually share in a hierarchical way, and we talked about this two stage prior, that how, how things would be done. So keep in mind about the differences. And um, one last thing is uh, at the top of the, I think, the middle page. Yeah, so here I did um, the derivation for the mu and tau as well. So um, keep in mind mu and tau, there are the parameters, the mean and the standard deviation of the prior for the mu j's. Okay, so I will just uh, give you some minutes to look at it. I mean, just look at whatever is on the screen, or if you have the document on your laptop, you can look at your laptop. Just really quick, uh, get a sense of what's being done, and also think about, yeah, what is being contributed in terms of uh, the posterior, full conditional posterior distribution in equation 10 and equation 12. Uh, so equation 10 is for mu, the other one, equation 12 is for 1 over tau square, okay? So think about that, convince yourself, yes, that should be right, hopefully nothing, uh, no typo in the derivation, and, uh, and then we're going to move on to, to next, okay? Any questions, comments? If you're very familiar with the normal model equation 10 that we see over here, like the update, if you look at the mean and uh, standard deviation of the expression, they're very similar to what we have done before, not in a hierarchical sense, just looking at like updating the mean of the normal model, okay? But of course, back then, mu itself um, is the mean, is the parameter of the mean for all of the observations, right? So that's why in the simple model, I mean, simple normal model case, all of those, that will just be the data point, right? And then this will just be the number of observations, okay? Whereas now, because mu is in the second stage of the prior, which is mu j, uh, this one, yeah. So yeah, think about it now, it's not, I mean, it's not so much about mu j. So mu j now is a parameter, and mu we know is a hyperparameter, but that's how they're linked, and then that's how the update is happening. So sometimes if you're very familiar with the whole thing, you can read off the results directly without doing the actual derivation. But this, um, of course, requires practice, and um, again, we. I want to do enough so we understand the model, uh, but beyond, as you notice, we are using JAX, which is a solver for you to do all of the uh, MCMC sampling. Uh, but still, I think it's important to understand uh, the mechanism and then how the updates are done. And um, well, if you ever wanted to write a Gibbs sample for the model yourself, I'm sure you have a much better understanding of the model than just using JAX. And um, say, like, the thing that I'm trying to say over here, especially about the mu j here. Well, if you're writing that, sampling that line from equation four, then you will, yeah, in order to, yeah, you will notice that, well, I'm only really using the observations in a 
particular group J when I'm dealing with mu J. And then that will, um, well, if you have to code it, I think you will know better what those expression, expression means. Um, but I'm hoping that just by showing it and then talk them through, um, you will still get an okay understanding of what's happening. Okay. All right, so I think that's um, so much that I want to talk about um, the derivation. And um, before we go to revisit um, Professor DiLeo's um, slides, I just want to maybe quickly talk about the structure here. And uh, one other thing is, I uh, just want to go through, I can find this. Yeah, just logistics wise, I just want to show you what we gonna do until the end of the semester. I think we are right here. Yeah, so today we'll do a little bit more of uh, like the revisit of the um, of the beginning video, and then you guys can work on lab four. And tomorrow and next Tuesday as well as later, uh, one section, one lecture ish, we're gonna do um, the last topic, which is Bayesian linear regression. Uh, the associate chapter is chapter nine in the textbook. And uh, I talked about like the progress and uh, timeline for the project, so make sure that you read it, but I also put them down here. So you notice that we have a midterm, another midterm, the last midterm, which is scheduled uh, two weeks from today. Okay, so I'm gonna do it in class, just like what we did last time. And uh, just to move things fast, I, I'm just gonna give you the take home afterwards and then on Thursday this spring, bring the take home part to class. But if you need extra time, let me know. Um, but it wouldn't be too long. It's just, um, I think a couple of hours, you will be able to finish. So hopefully um, during, during that week, those few days, you're able to do it. And um, also I feel, um, so I was, I, I had to like go out of town for some unexpected work. So I just gonna cancel the class uh, next Thursday. And uh, the plan is you will be able to uh, study for the midterm too, as well as work on your project. So I think that takes a lot of time overall as well. Okay, so um, so that's the plan for for next week. So this week we uh, we meet. Uh, um, yeah, we're gonna start next uh, on Thursday. We're gonna start talking about linear regression next Tuesday as well. But then uh, keep in mind lab four is due on Tuesday, and then the project methodology part. Draft. What I mean is, um, suppose in the end you have a 20-page um, presentation slides for your project, and um, I don't know, maybe eight pages, or it depends on uh, the depth of the model that you're dealing with. You might want to do, like, say, like five to ten pages of the methods themselves. Okay, so that is like different, like slide by slide. You talked about the model. Depends on what you're doing. You can do something, what we have been doing, say like, oh, this is the likelihood, this is the prior, think that through. And I just want to make sure that like everybody is working on the right thing at the right level uh, by next week. And then um, my plan is I'll give some feedback and um, like, yeah, like around Thursday time. And then I'll just email the feedback and I will ask you to meet in case we have to, probably not, I'm just gonna uh, give some feedback. And then Thursday, uh, Tuesday, Two weeks from today, we do the um, midterm, and then that Thursday, we're going to continue talking about linear regression. I have a few case studies towards the end, um, but so three weeks from today, the project draft should be um, submitted. We can make edits afterwards, of course, but I don't want to like drag towards the end because we all started um, early on. Okay, so that's the plan. You can um, check this um, page afterwards, and. Um, all right, so that will be the part about <clears throat> the model and the logistics. <clears throat>